genome to talk about the first step and actually using uh, that genome to express the genetic information that's included in it. This is the process of transcription. And so we're going to start by discussing sort of the fundamentals of transcription, the parts of this process that are really the same in every organism, and then uh, move on to discuss, first of all, some of the um, bacterial specific processes of transcription that were you know, the first that we understood and um, some uh, then discussed the eukaryotic uh, transcriptional apparatus. So um, the process of RNA synthesis chemically is almost exactly the same as the process of DNA synthesis. Um, so chemically, um, what happens is that the growing RNA strand has a free 3' free hydroxyl, and that hydroxyl performs a nucleophilic attack on the alpha phosphate of an NPP. Um, and that is assisted by two magnesium ions that are coordinated by the RNA polymerase. And in the end, um, this inorganic pyrophosphate leaves, and you form a phosphodiester between the 3'OH um, uh, and this 5' phosphate on the incoming DNTP, leaving behind a new 3'OH uh, that can be further extended. Um, and so you should recognize this looks exactly like the picture of uh, DNA synthesis, except uh, that the incoming NTP has a 3'OH, and of course there are some uracils rather than thymines in the growing RNA strand. So like DNA synthesis, RNA is always synthesized 5' to 3'. Uh, there's a chemical logic to that in that the, um, the 3' OH needs to attack this 5' phosphate. Um, and the uh, NTP is selected uh, by base pairing with the uh, DNA strand. So that's the way that information in DNA is copied into an RNA sequence that's exactly complementary uh, to the DNA sequence that is being used. The enzyme that carries this out is RNA polymerase. Um, it's shown here. It looks similar in um, bacteria and in eukaryotes. It has this um, the long groove where the DNA uh, template runs through the enzyme. Um, there are about 17 base pairs uh, that are unwound in what's called a transcription bubble um, as the uh, polymerase progresses. Um, some of those on the template strand are base paired to the growing RNA. So um, roughly eight nucleotides is base paired, though that actually can vary to some extent. Um, and then there's a separate uh, exit tunnel for the RNA uh, that is um, you know, melted off of the DNA and comes out here as the DNA rewinds at the end of this bubble. Um, and this proceeds at somewhere between 50 and 100 nucleotides a second. That's actually slower than DNA replication. Um, and um, so I think we mentioned before in discussing DNA topology, there is a uh, topological problem that does come up in transcription. It's basically illustrated here that if the RNA polymerase sort of, sort of anchor the DNA here, what's happening is that upstream of the polymerase, there is unwinding the template strand, so this untwisting decreases twist, and with no way to change the linking number, we would introduce positive rise, that is positive supercoiling ahead of the polymerase. Um, and exactly the converse thing happens on the other side of the polymerase, that as the transcription bubble closes up behind the polymerase and the DNA retwists, uh, the, the rise has to go down to compensate for that, and you get negative supercoiling. The rise is dropping below zero, so it's negative. Um, and um, in practice, in cells, uh, both this positive and this negative supercoiling are relieved by topoisomerases uh, that are acting during transcription. So a bit of uh, nomenclature. So um, the process of DNA replication um, ultimately copies both strands completely. But in RNA synthesis, it's asymmetric. Only one strand of the DNA duplex is going to be transcribed into RNA. So the template strand is a strand that's actually used by the RNA polymerase to make the RNA. And that means that the RNA is complementary to the template strand. Um, of course, the non-template DNA strand is also complementary to the template strand. So that means that the sequence of the transcript exactly matches the sequence of the non-template strand. And both of those are complementary to the template strand. 
Um, that also means, of course, that uh, the DNA is anti-parallelized as the RNA DNA double helix. So um, the synthesized RNA strand runs five prime to three prime along a template strand that's running, um, you know, it goes five prime to three in the opposite direction. So it's three prime to five prime on the template strand, five prime to three prime on the strand of RNA that's being made. Um, and so if you look at Atticus Maxwell's sequences here, um, that the template strand sequence shown here, running three prime to five prime, would correspond to this RNA uh, transcript synthesized from the left to the right here. And you can see that that exactly matches the sequence of the non-template DNA strand in the double helix, except, of course, for the fact that the T's, the thymines, in the DNA sequence are replaced with uracils in the RNA sequence. So, oh yeah. Yeah, so the question is, on this slide, when we have this bubble, and we're calculating the total state of this thing, so the bubble has some number of um, bases that are untwisted. And so if you're considering like this whole molecule, there would be some, some um, decrease in the overall twist of that molecule before it's actually melted apart. Um, so there's, I guess I would say there are two different things going on. One is the polymerase itself, um, when it just binds without doing anything, it untwists the DNA to some extent so that it can thread through two separate channels in the polymerase, one of which is going to base with the RNA, the other of which is just sort of held out of the way. Um, the other thing is that after it just melts these apart and as it starts to move, it essentially moves um, supercoiling or moves twisting, which causes supercoiling from one side to the other. So there's sort of two separate effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is, are you actually opening up the double strand of DNA? And the answer is yes. So this means that the RNA polymerase here has broken about 17 base pairs in this transcription bubble because it needs to break the DNA DNA base pairs because RNA DNA base pairing is the way that it creates an RNA whose sequence matches the DNA. So yes, yeah, so you are breaking base pairs. So. Transcription doesn't just happen anywhere. Um, if you look at essentially any genome, there are very specific transcripts that are synthesized out of that genome. Those essentially correspond to the, to the genes of that genome. So transcription starts at specific sites that are called promoters. And the convention is that we draw the RNA transcript as this arrow. Um, the arrow points five prime to three prime. And again, going back to the fact that we have a template strand and a non-template strand, so the arrow is pointing five prime to three prime in the direction of the RNA. And so in this example, that means that the lower strand would actually be the template strand here, and the upper strand would be the non-template strand, and we call the coding strand because that's the exact sequence that appears in the RNA in the end. Uh, so that's a DNA sequence that matches the RNA sequence, and uh, our sort of convention in writing this is that when we're t writing, say, the sequence of a promoter or, the, or anything, the sequence of DNA elements, we always write the sequence of the coding strand. Um, it's always what you'll see. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how can you distinguish between a coding strand and a template strand? And the answer is there is no molecular difference. Uh, a promoter is... Um, sort of specific to one strand, as we'll see. So what happens is this region in purple is a promoter, so that's a site of transcription initiation. It not only tells the polymerase where to start, it also tells it which strand to copy. And in fact, um, what you can see is that this is an example in a small viral genome, but this is true in essentially every organism, is that the DNA genome has transcripts that come from both strands. Um, so each individual transcript is associated with one specific strand that it comes from. But here, you know, this uh, gene up top is transcribed on one strand. There are several, you know, there are three genes present, uh, three transcripts created um, whose sequence matches. So this is sort of pointing five prime to three prime. So matches the top strand. And here, these transcripts, uh, they're uh, 
eight of them all match the bottom strand. And maybe another important point is that there are, first of all, there are regions of the genome that don't show up in any transcripts. And this gets to your question. There are also parts of the genome that show up in both transcripts. So this is more common in viral genomes, which tend to be very small, but we do see it in cellular genomes, too, that you can have a region of DNA that's transcribed in one strand under one condition and the opposite strand under some other condition. Um, yeah? Um, so it definitely does not only happen for prokaryotes. Um, there are a number of uh, cases in eukaryotes where you can see these overlapping things. I think what you're thinking of is the fact that prokaryotes tend to have smaller and more compact genomes, and so it's more likely that the transcripts will end up sort of overlapping each other a little bit. Um, but it's actually pretty common in budding yeast from a certain, which has a small genome tube in the eukaryote, and we definitely see it in humans too, though it's less common. Yeah. So the, bo sorry, the bottom transcript, actually, the unfortunate thing is that this is a picture from the book, and they, the arrows are put on the opposite side of what I think people would usually do, which is put the arrows on the side of the strand whose sequence they match. And so I, I would say that if we go back here, the important thing is the arrow points 5 prime to 3 prime on the strand that it exactly matches. So if we look here, um, these arrows pointing to the left would go... Uh, five prime to three prime on the bottom strand. And these arrows pointing to the right would go five prime to three prime on the top strand. So that's which transcripts would, would go to which strand. Um, I think that really the most important thing is the direction of the arrow. So the enzyme, the complex that's actually responsible for all of this is uh, in E. coli, as shown here, this is E. coli RNA polymerase. So it has. Um, five core subunits, that means there are five distinct proteins in this enzyme. Um, and it's responsible for synthesizing all the RNAs uh, produced in E. coli, the uh, mRNA, the rRNA, tRNA, and a number of other non-coding RNAs as well. Um, so about the only RNA synthesis that happens in E. coli that isn't produced by RNA polymerase, of course, primates acting during DNA synthesis, but those RNAs are very quickly degraded and never exist as stable separate RNAs in the cell. So E. coli RNA polymerase synthesizes all of the stable RNA you would ever isolate from E. coli. Um, and this core RNA polymerase can synthesize RNA, and you can reconstitute that in vitro with the enzyme itself, um, DNA template, and NTP substrates, uh, but it can't recognize promoters, and it, so it doesn't have the ability to transcribe specific regions of the genome. Um, so I mentioned it has five uh, separate proteins that make it up. Uh, the two large ones are called beta and beta prime, and the active side is essentially split between these two. It's, there's more of it in the beta prime subunit. You can see here, people draw it like this lobster claw here. The DNA uh, runs through this long uh, groove here. Um, so beta and beta prime really carry out the uh, synthesis. Um, there are two uh, identical copies of this alpha subunit protein that serve a structural role um, in holding together beta beta prime and also in interacting with some other proteins that interact with this enzyme. And there's this um, omega uh, that again plays a sort of a structural role. Um, so uh, one difference between uh, RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase, even though the process of catalysis is very, very similar, uh, there's no proofreading uh, exonuclease in RNA polymerase, so it actually has an error rate of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 5, uh, which, if you remember, is comparable to the error rate of a DNA polymerase with no proofreading activity. Um, and actually, um, this gets to a more sort of a conceptual question about sort of the difference between replication and transcription, um, which is that the RNA polymerase lacks this proofreading activity. And here are four proposed explanations. Actually, three of them are not true. There's only one. Uh, true explanation here, and so the answer is which is the true explanation that uh, might explain why uh, RNA polymerase has no proofreading activity.
sequence of the protein, but it's not a permanent change. That specific RNA would have a sequence change that would affect the specific proteins translated from that RNA, but the offspring of that cell would not be affected by the fact that it made one uh, faulty RNA copy. Um, regarding the chemistry of the RNA backbone and RNA base pairing, both are very similar to DNA. It's certainly the same uh, nucleophilic attack and cleavage that uh, work on DNA also work on RNA. Um, and the base pairing between uh, you know, uracil and um, adenine and between thymine and adenine is, is exactly the same. Um, the, the, the methyl group that distinguishes them does not affect their base pairing properties at all. So, um, so the answer here that's true is that those RNA sequence changes uh, wouldn't be inherited and so the cell doesn't invest um, as much um, energy and resources in making sure that RNA transcripts are perfect and lack any errors. Professor? Yeah. What about retroviruses? Sorry, what about? Retroviruses. Retroviruses, yeah. So retroviruses, you know, potentially, yeah, that the, the RNA sequence chain is in a retrovirus would be inherited, yeah. Um, we'll talk about those next time towards the end of class. Um, so um, I mentioned that E. coli RNA polymerase doesn't have a way to um, recognize uh, promoters on its own or figure out where to start transcription. And um, the information to do that comes from a separate um, subunit called a sigma factor. Um, and so sigma 70 is sort of the, the generic sigma factor in E. coli that's responsible for recognizing um, most of the promoters used during ordinary growth conditions. We'll talk about some different sigma factors um, later when we talk about gene regulation. But um, essentially the sigma factor directly binds to some DNA sequences um, as well as binding to the RNA polymerase itself. And it forms um, this, uh, this pre-initiation complex here. Um, and so this is the very first step in beginning transcription, and it is one of the steps that's very tightly controlled to ensure both exactly where you start transcription and what transcript you make, as well as how often it happens to determine how much of different RNAs you make. Um, and so the sigma factor uh, recognizes specific DNA sequence elements uh, before um, so they're upstream of the place where the RNA is actually going to start. So for sigma 70, it recognizes a region, two regions, what are called the minus 35 region and the minus 10 region. And it recognizes a specific uh, consensus sequence at those two positions. Um, and I'll get on to what I mean by a consensus sequence, but this specific sequence here is the one um, that it likes best. So there are two six nucleotide stretches that it recognizes, and it also wants them at specific positions relative to each other. So this N17 means that it wants to have essentially 17 bases um, between those two six, uh, six nucleotide regions, but it doesn't care um, exactly what those bases are, just the distance between them. Um, and so a couple of notes about this. First of all, when we're writing these sequences, the convention is that we write the sequences that appear on the coding strand. So of course, this is DNA, so really there's you know, TTG on the, 
on one strand, and on the other strand there'll be you know a TGT CAA running in the other direction. But when you write this sequence, you write uh, what's on the coding strand. Um, the other um, is uh, again the sort of historical convention we call the first base that is included in the RNA transfer the plus one base. We call the base immediately before that the minus one base, and there is no zero base, which is actually in some cases a real uh, nuisance, but this is the convention that everyone uses in molecular biology. So the sequence I'm showing here is the one that's recognized by sigma 70, and we'll talk later that different sigma factors exist in E. coli that can recognize different sequences. And um, what we see is that if we look at the actual sequences of various real promoters um, in the cell, they're all very similar, but not exactly identical to this consensus motif. So what you can see is that you know, looking down here, um, you know, almost every gene has an A in this position, but this one has a G. Almost every gene has a C in this uh, second position, this one has a T. Almost every gene has a T in this position here, but this one has a C and so forth. Um, and so the sigma factor will still bind to regions of DNA that have, say, one or two changes, one or two differences um, from this perfect consensus sequence. But the better it matches, the higher the affinity a sigma factor is for that sequence, um, which means that it more efficiently recruits RNA polymerase there. So you have more uh, rounds of RNA polymerase recruitment. Um, each one of those is associated with transcription, so you get actually more RNA produced from that gene. Um, so in addition to this effect where matching the sort of ideal sigma factor consensus uh, gives you more transcription, there are sort of auxiliary elements that uh, promoters can have. Um, and in um, E. coli, this up element actually directly binds to the alpha subunits of the core polymerase. Um, so an up element isn't uh, sufficient to get you transcription, but it does improve uh, transcription by improving the recruitment of RNA polymerase. Um, and you can see the up element here in the RNB gene. Um, this is an extremely highly transcribed gene because it actually um, encodes the rRNA, uh, which is one of the most abundantly produced transcripts in the cell. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, essentially, if you only have a single template, um, isn't there a limit to how much RNA polymerase that you can load onto that? Um, the, the, the answer is that there is something of a limit, but keep in mind, the RNA polymerase only unwinds about 17 bases, and it physically encloses slightly more of the template, but it certainly um, you know, doesn't enclose much, enclose much more than, say, 30 or 40 bases in total, and so you could have one RNA polymerase that loads on and starts, and as soon as it is moved well away from the promoter, but before it's finished transcribing, you could have a second RNA polymerase come on and start transcribing. So I don't have a picture here, uh, but in the case of um, the rRNA genes in eukaryotes, which are uh, transcribed extremely highly, you can see these structures where uh, in an electron micrograph, where the DNA sort of threads to the middle, and you have coming off of the sides all of these uh, RNA transcripts from all of the polymerases that are transcribing the same RNA gene at the same time. You can have you know, dozens of them at once. Um, yeah. When you're talking about how well how well it matches, you're saying this one is my favorite, this one's mm -hmm. Yeah. What is that actually like? Is that um, yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, so, so the question is, what you know, when we're talking about how well something matches the consensus, what is it trying to match? Um, and the answer is the sigma factor has a DNA binding preference. It's actually not determined by you know, complementary base pairing. It's actually making contacts with parts of the DNA um, in, in sort of on the side of the helix. So I'll talk about this more later. Um, but there are ways for proteins to bind to closed DNA and nonetheless have preferences for the sequence of that DNA based on essentially the chemical nature of the, the non-base pairing sides of the, the nucleotides. Um, I think you can sort of appreciate that here. You know, first of all, um, note that the sigma factor binds to DNA in this, what, what's called a closed conformation, where the double helix is still closed up, so it doesn't have direct access 
to the base pairing regions that it's recognizing other features of the DNA based on its sequence. And um, the answer is that it is that sort of energetically favorable interactions with certain sequences and unfavorable with others based on hydrogen bonding and also sterics. Um, and so this, this um, core RNA polymerase plus the sigma factor forms this closed complex and then a separate step is unwinding. And initially it unwinds about 12 base pairs, it expands to about 17 as the polymerase is elongating. Um, and so this transition from a closed complex to an open complex is sort of the second step in uh, transcription initiation. Um, the next thing that happens is actually cycles of what are called abortive initiation. So the RNA polymerase can actually start a new transcript uh, with no primer at all. So remember, DNA polymerases can never do that. And in fact, um, the DNA polymerases need an RNA primer made by a specialized RNA polymerase to, to extend. RNA polymerase can start new, so it essentially just takes two NTPs matching the first two nucleotides, puts them together, and forms that bond. Um, and it turns out that what it actually does is synthesize some amount of RNA, and then often um, it essentially aborts and returns to this open complex form. Um, the sigma factor is still there and interacting with the uh, promoter. Um, and eventually there's a step called promoter clearance. And when this happens, the polymerase moves beyond uh, the promoter. Um, it you know, continues synthesizing an RNA that's now you know, substantially longer than this, 20 to 30 bases, uh, that it keeps extending. And, um, and this actually can also be sort of a regulated step that there are some uh, promoters where promoter clearance is more efficient and some promoters where promoter clearance is actually not very efficient and the polymerase stays stuck in many uh, rounds of futile synthesis of these very short RNA oligos until it can finally begin elongating and actually transcribing the entire transcript, which is typically you know, hundreds to thousands of uh, bases long. Um, and after promoter clearance, RNA polymerase elongation is highly persistent. So even in uh, E. coli, it can be many um, tens of thousands of uh, bases long. Um, and one important point is there's no mechanism to restart RNA synthesis after the polymerase disengages entirely. So in, replica in DNA replication, there's a process where the, the polymerase can load back on to the DNA and continue extending if it falls off somehow. In the case of RNA polymerase, once it terminates, it lets go of the RNA entirely, um, releases it, and um, it can't continue. Um, so RNA polymerase is you know, very processive, um, but there are specific mechanisms that terminate transcription at the end of a, of a gene. Um, and there are two major mechanisms in E. coli which this happens. One is called intrinsic or row independent termination. And this occurs when a um, RNA and DNA sequence alone is capable of triggering the polymerase to stop. And the sequence for this is the, 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 um, yeah, the, the sequence that triggers this uh, intrinsic termination is a sequence that will fold up into a hairpin in the RNA template followed by a string of uh, uracil bases in the template. And so the, this poly U trapped in the RNA does actually two things. The first is that it happens to pause transcription. Uh, so the transcription slows down slightly when it runs into this. Um, and, of course, um, the RNA is being held on to the um, uh, DNA template by base pairing. And so a stretch of UA bases in base, base pairs in a row is relatively weak. Um, and this, um, the RNA stem loop that forms, um, in some way, actually triggers the separation of the RNA template from the DNA, and then the RNA moves out of the polymerase and transcription is terminated. And there are a couple of models, it's not actually clear which of, the, which of these um, happens. Uh, one model proposes that the stem loop interacts with the polymerase in some specific sort of way um, to end the transcription. The other is that simply the folding of the hairpin uh, provides a force that pulls the RNA off of the DNA template. Um, but in any case, um, when the polymerase synthesizes an RNA hairpin followed by a trap or several U's in a row, um, it will tend to pause and then terminate transcription. Um, there's another pathway that's actually not intrinsic to 
the polymerase and the synthesizing, but actually requires a separate protein factor uh, called Rho. So uh, Rho is an ATP-dependent RNA helicase. Um, it loads onto a specific RNA sequence uh, called a RUT site. Um, and when this uh, Rho helicase is loaded, um, it will hydrolyze ATP to move in a directional fashion down the RNA. Um, and if this happens at a place uh, where the polymerase is pausing, um, then actually this row can catch up with the polymerase. And um, again, it's not totally clear the, the mechanism here. Either this row helicase is simply pulling the RNA out of the polymerase and separating it from the template, or there might be some more sort of specific molecular interaction between the helicase and the polymerase. But in either case, when the polymerase is paused, the row loads onto a rut site and then catches up with the polymerase, um, it does another mechanism to terminate uh, transcription. So um, the basic process of RNA synthesis in eukaryotes is uh, quite similar to the process in prokaryotes. Uh, one difference, though, is that eukaryotes actually have three major RNA polymerases. Um, RNA polymerase one is uh, responsible for uh, more than half of total RNA synthesis in the cell, but it synthesizes only one single transcript, the um, free ribosomal RNA that's processed and is a structural RNA component in the ribosome. Um, so actually our RNA makes up 80 to 90% of the RNA content in a cell, so uh, the eukaryotic cell has a specialized polymerase just to do this. Uh, there's also an RNA polymerase three, um, which is responsible for trend, which is responsible for transcribing a collection of short non-coding RNA genes. So these include the transfer RNAs, um, one small ribosomal RNA, and a collection of other uh, small non-coding RNAs. Probably it produces hundreds of different transcripts in total. Um, but uh, RNA polymerase two uh, is going to be our uh, main focus of attention. It transcribes all coding messenger RNAs, many longer non-coding RNAs, has a very complex, very highly regulated initiation process uh, because it needs to transcribe many different mRNAs at different levels and at different times. Um, yeah? Um, are the still have a three prime RNA polymerase 2 does not have a, a three prime to five prime exonuclease. No. So eukaryotic, eukaryotic RNA polymerase don't have that either. Uh, pardon? Right, yep, the, the three prime to five prime exonuclease proofreading is only in DNA polymerases. So RNA polymerase two uh, in eukaryotes is very similar, as I said, to E. coli RNA polymerase. It's actually made up of 12 different proteins. Um, two of them, the two largest, called RPB1 and RPB2, are orthologs, so you can clearly see a sequence and a structural relationship between the beta and the beta prime subunits of E. coli polymerase, and they, again, contain um, the active site with the magnesium ions that uh, coordinate the nucleophilic attack. Um, there are also um, orthologs of the alpha dimer, so as is often the case, we see that a protein that's present in two identical copies in bacteria is actually duplicated and specialized into two separate proteins um, in eukaryotes, these are RPB3 and RPB11, um, and also, this actually shares several subunits um, in common with polymerase 1 and polymerase 3. Um, so if we look at eukaryotic uh, PAL2 promoters, um, they are meant to, they're substantially more complex. So there are several different sequence elements that can show up in a eukaryotic um, PAL2 promoter. Uh, no single element is required at all promoters. And here are a few listed here that have been defined. Um, the Tata box was really the first uh, sequence element defined in eukaryotic promoters. Um, and uh, it turns out that it's only present in about 30% of promoters, but because it was um, defined first and because a specific protein that recognizes it was also uh, discovered, uh, you know, it's often um, is uh, discussed as having sort of a particular significance. But you can have a promoter that lacks a Tata element, but perhaps has this initiation region or this downstream promoter element, and that's sufficient uh, to allow transcription. So it's, I mean, first of all, it's much harder to recognize a PAL2 promoter, and they're much more uh, variable. And as you might expect by the fact that you can have sequence elements strung all the way from 
almost 40 bases upstream to, to almost 40 bases downstream of the promoter, um, the initiation complex is also um, more complicated. So uh, the Paul II transcription in, uh, initiation involves many uh, different what are called general transcription factors. They're called general because um, they're thought to be involved in most uh, transcription by Paul II. Um, and they have these names like their uh, TF2A, TF2B, and so forth. And many of these uh, general transcription factor TF2s are themselves multi-protein complexes. So in fact, um, this assemblage here includes you know, well over 30 individual proteins. Um, one of them you can see here, TBP, stands for TATA binding protein, which binds to this TATA element. Um, and then the TF2B and TF2D uh, subunits uh, recognize some other ones of these as well, that some of these different um, promoter elements. Um, and the process of transcription initiation, again, begins with the assembly of these um, TF2 factors along with the core polymerase onto a promoter, and uh, it forms what's called a pre-initiation or a closed complex. Um, and then um, initiation happens as unwinding of the DNA to form an open complex. Um, and again, you can have cycles of abortive initiation, the synthesis of you know, short like 10 nucleotide long uh, RNA segments until the polymerase actually enters into an elongation-like complex. The regulation of uh, the transition from this open complex to active elongation um, is somewhat different in eukaryotes, though, and most notably, it's associated with phosphorylation of the C-terminal domain of uh, RNA polymerase. So this um, CPD uh, labeled here um, has a, a, a special importance in eukaryotes. It's not present in prokaryotes. Um, it, it, it's called the C-terminal domain because the C-terminus of the RPD1, the largest protein in the uh, core uh, Paul II complex, and it consists of 25 to 50 um, identical repeats, almost identical repeats of this, it's called the heptapeptide, seven amino acids in a row um, that string out in an unstructured tail um, dangling off of the end of polymerase. Um, and in the transition from the open complex initiation to actual elongation, um, the five position, the fifth serine on each of these heptapeptide repeats is phosphorylated by TF2H. So it has a, a protein kinase activity that uses ATP to transfer a phosphate onto all of these SIR5 positions. Um, and in fact, um, as, uh, uh, el as elongation proceeds, um, there are these elongation factors, uh, including PKFB, that can load on and phosphorylate a different serine residue, serine 2. So at, in the pre-initiation complex, the CTD is totally unphosphorylated. Um, uh, it needs to be totally unphosphorylated in order to form the pre-initiation complex. But as it transitions from the open complex to the elongation complex, TF2H phosphorylates serine 5, PTFB can come in and phosphorylate serine 2. And so the diagram here, the different states of the RNA polymerase C terminal domain uh, that you'll see at different uh, points in the cycle of transcribing a gene. Um, so TF2H is actually a very interesting um, initiation factor. Um, so it uh, contains a few different activities. So, first of all, um, it has three proteins that together function as a protein kinase um, that phosphorylates serine 5 to the C-terminal domain uh, during uh, the transition from the open complex initiation into the elongating stage. Um, it also has a DNA helicase, uh, this protein XPB, um, that um, hydrolyzes ATP in order to unwind uh, the DNA at the promoter uh, during transcription initiation. Uh, there's a number of other factors as well, but one of the things about uh, TF2H that I think is particularly surprising um, is that two of these genes in here, XPB and XPD, are actually genes uh, whose names you might recognize in the previous lecture, because they're genes 
um, where mutations in them actually cause defects in DNA repair. So, the, so mutations in these genes um, cause this uh, zero derma pigmentosa um, characterized by a UV sensitivity and the lack of nucleotide excision repair. So um, this same uh, set of proteins that are involved in transcription initiation um, also play a role in the process of nucleotide excision repair. And in fact, one of these same uh, DNA helicases that unwinds um, the promoter uh, in order to allow uh, entry into the open complex also uh, plays a role in unwinding uh, the damaged DNA strand after cleavage and nucleotide excision repair. But to remind you, in NER, um, a you know, large, bulky DNA lesion exists, and so this is not a case where you can simply cut out a single effective base. You actually need to cut out a large chunk of the backbone because the damage might actually involve uh, the backbone. And so um, after cleavage to remove a um, substantial chunk of that backbone, here uh, you need DNA helicases to separate out um, this cleaved piece of DNA away from the backbone. And it turns out that the ATP-dependent DNA unwinding activity of XPB, which also acts in, uh, tran in transcription initiation, as well as XPD, which is a helicase with the sort of opposite directionality, are responsible for this unwinding in eukaryotes. Um, because after this unwinding, the DNA polymerase epsilon uh, fills in the removed region and DNA ligase then seals this final gap. Um, so um, the, these two helicases um, are not um, you know, totally redundant. Both of these helicases have a uh, directionality. So of course the DNA strand is directional and one of these helicases uh, moves in a three prime to five prime direction to unwind DNA and the other in a five prime to three prime direction. So together um, they're able to work and entirely unwind this um, in eukaryotes. It's about a 29 base pair stretch of DNA uh, that's been cleaved um, and remove this lesion. And the sort of occurrence of these DNA helicases in both a transcription uh, complex as well as a DNA repair complex is not sort of purely coincidental. There's actually in eukaryotes a process called transcription coupled repair, which is a specialized kind of nucleotide excision repair. So I told you that this um, nucleotide excision repair as it was uh, first discovered in E. coli works by recognizing the distorted backbone of the DNA where you have a bulky lesion, for instance, a thymine-thymine dimer or a thymine-thymine cross-linked um, changes the positions of the two bases relative to each other and distorts the backbone. And that um, is recognized by the nucleotide excision repair in order to cut this strand like here and here and remove it. Another process uh, that can discover bulky lesions in DNA is uh, the transcription by RNA polymerase II. So of course, the, polymer the RNA polymerase, like the DNA polymerase, works by base pairing um, new NTPs against the backbone. And in fact, um, in the case of a large bulky lesion, something like this thymine thymine dimer, it actually can't proceed, it can't synthesize um, an RNA strand against a template that's been damaged in this way. And so a bulky lesion showing up specifically on the template strand will stall RNA polymerase too. And a stalled RNA polymerase is an alternative trigger for nucleotide excision repair. And in fact, this TF2H complex, which is normally involved in um, initiation, will be recruited back to the elongating RNA polymerase when it stalls. And it'll trigger nucleotide excision repair, um, where the nuclease will come in and cleave around um, the damaged sites blocking the progress of polymerase. And then the helicase activities will strip out um, this damaged piece of DNA. So it's actually an interesting connection back from the process of transcription from in fact, resolving this problem of a stalled RNA polymerase uh, back to uh, repairing the DNA. Yeah. Yeah, so the alternate trigger is a, a, a unresolvable stall of RNA polymerase because the template strand um, can't base pair correctly to a newly synthesized RNA. Yeah. Yeah. 
And um, one interesting feature of this is that um, DNA repair in eukaryotes um, is more effective on the template strand of coding sequences specifically. So regions that are transcribed and specifically on uh, the template strand, which um, is uh, useful in some ways. That's the part that actually directly you know, contains the genetic information that's going to be transcribed into RNA. Um, so um, that's uh, all I had for today about transcription. Uh, the termination in eukaryotes is uh, actually coupled to some interesting processing RNA. So we'll start with that.